It's about six weeks after Ireland defeated Romania in the World Cup, about eight weeks before you finish celebrating. <laughs> And I got here, and everybody hated gay. That fucking gay, man. They love hacker, you fucking hoth bastard. <laughs> the minute he was gone, oh, bring back gay. We love gay. Pat Kenny's a fucking plank. Bring back gay. <laughs> you just missed having a hack at him. You wanted him back so you could have one more hack at the old gray haired fecker, you know? And it'll be the same when Pat's gone. Pat'll go, and everybody, oh, God, bring back Pat. This Ryan Tubbard is a fucking Egypt. Yeah, right, Tuberty. <laughs> Nobody's that fucking happy, bro. Where's the real Ryan Tuberty, man? I want to see the real... Nobody's that happy all the time. I want to see the real Ryan Tuberty on his new TV show. Somebody pisses him off and he's just like, look, fuck off, right? <laughs> just cop on, okay? <laughs> Seriously, like, come on. <laughs> Sorry, huh? <laughs> what? So I wore a cork jersey on a late, late, man. It was a, it was a big deal. No, it was a big deal. I mean, you know, whatever. Obviously, different people have different. It's not, I, I'm not really trying to be divisive here, but it was a big deal, you know? I committed to cork for the rest of my life. Because when you're American, you live in this beautiful, neutral ground when it comes to supporting GAA teams. You know, you don't really have to make a decision. But I went on national TV and committed to cork for the rest of my life. That's a huge commitment, you know, just to get a ticket to the All-Island. <laughs> now, I got my ticket. That's the thing. And I went, you know? But the thing is that my girlfriend's father got me the ticket. So and now I'm committed to her as well. <laughs> it's a lot of commitment just to go to a match. But I was there, though. Very strange thing when you walk into Croke Park two days after you've been begging for a ticket on the late, late, and you're wearing your cork jersey, and you walk into the Cusick stand entrance, and you walk into the sea of red, and the whole place just turns around. You got your fucking ticket anyway! <laughs> Fair play, you got your ticket! Come here, come here, get a fucking picture with the boys! Come here, get a picture! Take a picture now! I, 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 a fucking picture now! My Fair play, you're one of us! You're one of us! Up the rivers, up the rivers! I saw you in the late, late Fair play, I wouldn't normally be in a Friday, but I was saving up for coming up to Dublin Fair play, yeah. One of the boys, one of the boys! Holy fuck! <laughs> I felt. <laughs> I felt so included, you know? Finally, 14 years in this country, and I was part of it, you know? What a better venue to find out you're part of it than fucking Croke Park, you know? My new friends, it was amazing. I just felt so good, you know? And I walked away from them, and I walked into the entrance. Now, the thing was, my girlfriend's dad had gotten me a premium level ticket, a corporate box ticket. Now, I would have taken any ticket. I just wanted to go to the match, you know? And I walked in towards the premium level entrance, and my brand new friends turned around, and they were like, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Premium level ticket, is it? Fuck off, you're not one of the real people at all, boy. <laughs> Mr. Fucking Minimum Wage, is it? <laughs> but I didn't need their approval anymore. I didn't need their approval anymore because I was part of it. And as I walked through that stadium, and I looked out at that green grass, and the place was electric. Jesus, things changed inside me that day. There's such a huge energy in Croke Park. It's too much, you know, as the two teams march around, weapons in hand. <laughs> and as they pass your section, everyone stands up. <laughs> like they're going off to war. That's why there's no need for an Irish army. All the differences will be sorted out in the pitch. All those deaf fuckers wasted their time. Always, always gets a delayed reaction. It's where there was buckets of them in. Such an energy, man. It's too much. It's actually too much, you know? That's why there's a huge gaping hole in Croke Park. So some of that energy can get out. If they closed off Croke Park, the place would explode on All Ireland Day. 
That's why there's so many troublemakers from the north side of Dublin. Because on the big days in Croke Park, the energy leaks out. And all the little fellas from the Dublin tree area are like, Whoa, what the fuck is that? I have to rob a car or something like, fuck. Uh. <laughs> and he's going down Amy and Street and he turns the corner onto Talbot Street. <laughs> and the guardian behind him. <laughs> Seamus McDonough, he's been in the guardian for 12 years. <laughs> he's known for ramming the back and oh, he rams in the back. And the two boys crash into Michael Guineys, but they make a fine left hand turn. And hide in a pool hall with 20 people ready to kick the fucking living heart out of the Gardaí. <laughs> uh. That was improvised. <sighs> yeah, it was just amazing, man. The energy in that place. Something changed inside me that day. It was as if I was being propelled forward 50 years, propelled backward 50 years, and steadfastly nailed to the present. All at that one moment, as the national anthem started to play, I could feel Ireland changing in front of my very face. Everybody standing up. I fucking sang it. <laughs> Didn't know the words, but I fucking sang it anyway. <laughs> I wasn't the only one, I'll have you know. Many the Hummer beside me. <laughs> I don't know the Irish just to fit in. I bless myself and I'm an Augustan, Vic Augustan spirit. And they've now come on to fuck. <laughs> and the energy rose with every hammering of the beats from the Artane Abuse Boys Band. Things changed inside me. I could feel Ireland changing. And as it began to with every beat of that drum. I knew things were moving on. I knew that fella's dad had been raped by the church, but he was moving on. I know the GAA are backward, but we're moving on. You can say fuck on the late, late now. And as the crowd started to roar, earlier and earlier every year it seems to me, and I felt that climax rush up inside me. I knew that the minute I left that stadium, I was going to kill British people. <laughs> Things became very clear to me, very quickly. And as that slitter was thrown into the middle of the pitch and the first clash of the ash snapped around the stadium, I realized that there would be no fucking rugby or soccer or fucking you two here ever again. <laughs> or homosexuals. <laughs> Not because gay men are banned from the GAA, but because no gay man would ever be caught dead in those most unstylish uniforms. <laughs> Never will you hear a bunch of gay men together going, you know, O'Neill shorts rammed up your hole. I just so totally in this fear. I have to get a pair. What an energy. Passion, you know? Amateurs playing for pride in the jersey, working all week, showing up in Coke Park, coming off as subs, blood pumping out of their faces, the announcers trying to figure out what's wrong. He's coming off with the blood pump. Is he late? For is, he, is he injured? No, he's late for work. He's working for the permanent TSB. He's closing the deal at half four. 2.9% APR. Another Dublin fucking Egypt moving to Mullingar thinking he's gonna save money. <laughs> Spend the rest of his life in roundabouts. <laughs> waiting for bypasses that never finish. <laughs> Amazing. And I was there, man, my first All-Ireland. Never forget it as long as I live, you know. It's a very, you know, it's a very amazing energy. It travels all over the world, you know. Not like soccer or other sports where everybody knows about it. It travels in these little selected pockets, you know. 
Men in New York, emigrants from Ireland in the 1950s, wake up in Brooklyn, spend half their morning going across New York on the one in the nine train through Manhattan to get to some Irish club in the North Bronx at half nine in the morning to watch the match live, eating Denny's sausages imported nine years ago. <laughs> Drinking pints of Guinness like diarrhea. Because Guinness doesn't travel. <laughs> Sean Oak's third cousins in Fiji watching the match in a hut on Satanta Sports, <laughs> doing Fijian hackers for the boys in Croke Park. De young doc, de young doc, de young! Pulling it, ground hurling. <laughs> San Francisco, come on, Cork! <laughs> Amazing. Very patronizing thing, though, being an American in Croke Park when a lot of people know who you are. Would you understand what's going on here in all night? <laughs> There'd be no pads and hurling in all night. <laughs> I know what's going on. I went to St. Peter's College, Wexford. I know about hurling. Rory McCarthy was in my class. All-Ireland winner, 1996. Dar Ryan, year ahead of me, still one of the great fullbacks. I know about hurling. I showed up in that school and they turned to me, every single one, and they said, Fuck off, Yank. <laughs> you can't play fucking hurling. Fuck off, you're queer, fucking weird. You can't play hurling. <laughs> and they were correct. <laughs> Never seen a hurl in my life. They're illegal in 39 states of America. <laughs> because mad emigrants in the 1860s escaping the hunger and the famine showed up to sign up for the Union Army in the American Civil War with this strange Indian-like weapon. <laughs> and they were beheading young Confederate soldiers on the fields of Gettysburg. Go on, Seamus, pull at him. He hits the niggers. Pull at him. <laughs> please, sir, I don't believe in slavery, sir. I'm just poor like you, sir. Please, fucking pull at him, Seamus. Pull at him. <laughs> ah! Ah! So I know about hurling. Father Butler was our dean in St. Peter's, famous amongst the Wexford people. He represented the real energy of the GAA. He had two loves in this life, the GAA and anger. <laughs> he was the type of GAA man that was so fundamentalist GAA that even Gaelic football was a bit gay. So one day as boarders, we went down to the ref for breakfast, cold winter's morning. We went in with a simple request. We asked him, Father, could we have some toast? Didn't think it was a big deal, <laughs> seeing as there was bread <laughs> and a toaster. <laughs> and honest to God, if there were people from St. Peter's here today, they could vouch for me. His reply was, toast is for pregnant women. So I know about fucking hurling. <laughs> so just to spite them, they told me I couldn't play. So just to spite them, senior hurling trials, 1990 in St. Peter's, I showed up, never played hurling in my life, and I showed up to play with men who would go on to win all Ireland's. And again, they said, fuck off, Yank, you can't play hurling. And I said, give me that fucking hurl. <laughs> I mightn't hit the ball, but I'll hit your shins, you patty cunt. <laughs> and the trainer said, go away, Yank. But well, come back next year, you haven't got the skills, but you've the right attitude. <laughs> and I was there, man. Croke Park, and I was so into it, you know? Never once did a word come out of my mouth in an American accent. It wasn't a decision I made, it just wouldn't happen. You know, never once was I like, come on, Cork! Pull on it! <laughs> Referee! just doesn't happen. Anytime I open my mouth, REFEREE! <laughs> He's fucking putting on him in! You know when you get so into it, shouting just isn't enough. You have to do all the act. REFEREE! He's fucking putting on him in! <laughs> open your fucking eyes, man! <laughs> Did he slap you, is it? Put it up! I 
I support Cork, and I realized that I would support Cork for the rest of my life. The first time I heard that word, Satanta. <laughs> Satanta. It doesn't get more Republican than Satanta. Jesus, the first time I heard that word, cried out over the loudspeaker, I thought I was going to see a man fly into Croke Park on a white winged horse. <laughs> like the Pegasus. Next up in the forwards for Cork, Satanta or Halpine. <laughs> Sean Og with the horn. <laughs> Everyone in Croke Park. <laughs> Satanta. Is he going? I'm going to Australia, boy. <laughs> so that's it. I'm here now. That's the point. I'm stuck here. I've embraced Ireland. That's it. People in New York don't know who the fuck I am. Irish people come up to me. My family's in New York. They never fucking heard of you. It's like, I know, New Yorkers don't find it funny when an American can do a Cork accent. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm stuck here and I'm used to it now, you know. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm used to the Irish women. The American women are the ones I find complicated now. <laughs> you know, there's too much protocol that goes with meeting an American woman. You know, you go to a nightclub. Then you gotta get their number. Then you call her. Then she screens your number, does like an FBI background check on you. <laughs> make sure you're not a terrorist. <laughs> then you go out on a couple of dates. I've made the mistake of asking Irish girls out on dates. Hey, you wanna go on a date? A date? <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> Fucking date. <laughs> Irish people don't date. We go for a drink. <laughs> yeah, I know that's a date. No! All my friends will be there. Be great crack. <laughs> I don't want to meet your friends. I, I want to meet you. I tell you what, why don't you go out with your friends, right? And then text me when you're finished. My favorite text of all, are you awake? <laughs> are you pissed? <laughs> Come on over. Don't forget the cord for the gate. <laughs> oh yeah, Irish people don't date. Irish people go out to the nightclub. Get bleh. <laughs> pissed out of their heads waiting for, come on Eileen to come on, you know what I mean? <laughs> Just maul into each other. Irish people don't date, they shift. That's the other thing I learned in Wexford, lads. <laughs> and I got to Wexford, and I'll tell you something, Ireland has been liberated sexually, no doubt, but your language of love has not been liberated along with it. <laughs> your language of love is all wrong. Words like shift. I got to Wexford and the boys were like, did you shift or yank, did you? <laughs> did you shift or yank, did you? How did you? <laughs> stay, stay. It's the wrong word for something as beautiful as kissing another human being. So, it's like a keyboard, you know? Did you shift her? Did you? I capitalized her. She loved it. Six times. The sixth time I couldn't get it up. What would you do? I pressed Control Alt D. Went all night. Did you get off with her? It's even worse. <laughs> get off means this. How can you put the word get off on something that means come as close as possible? 
Get the fuck away from me means the same thing. Did you get the fuck away from me with her? Does it make sense? Did you write her? <laughs> so physical, it's so wrong. And the male response is even worse. The Irish male response. Did I write her? I fucking bursted her. <laughs> Bet the hole off her. Tore it into it. Broke the bed. <laughs> it's not sexy. It's a sublimation of anger because your mother didn't show you real physical affection. You think Irish girls find it sexy they get together on a Monday? How did it go with Bobby last night? Well, he ripped the key out of me. <laughs> the friction. So, uh, what I was gonna say is Ireland has definitely been liberated sexually, that's a fact. And Irish women have one night stands, that is also a fact. In fact, I would go so far as to say Irish women have more one night stands than American women. And that's not to say that you're slutty or in any way, it's just in America we have a thing called serial killers, makes people a little bit paranoid. <laughs> Whereas in Ireland, it's like you go to a club and it's like, you're from Edlone, do you know Seamus? You do, lovely, let's go fucking, let's go. Like, there's no barriers here, everybody knows everybody, you know? But for some reason, when you're about to have a one night stand with an Irish woman, no matter how liberated you've been sexually, just at that moment when it's about to happen, you're both at that beautiful moment of consensual intimacy with people you don't know. And uh, <laughs> the Irish woman will always turn to you and say, you know, I don't normally do this. <laughs> to which I have to reply, well, I, I do. So uh, <laughs> keep your shit on your side of the bed. I haven't got Sister Mary singing hymns of repression in my fucking ear right now. I just want to have a good time. <laughs> Every now and then you get lucky. You meet some dirty Irish Celtic love kid. And the first time I got one of these girls back to me, Gaff. Clothes ripped off. Scratch marks down me back. Sweat dripping down. Baby oil dripping down. But slower, because it had a higher viscosity. and I lost the run of myself. I pulled her hair and she pulled mine and I said, do you want to have a shower, you filthy little thing? And she said, I'd love to have a shower. And I said, ah, I just have to turn on the immersion. <laughs> it's gonna be about a half an hour. <laughs> Wouldn't be a Des Bishop show without one reference to the immersion. <laughs> But I figured it out now, you know, 14 years, I figured out the Irish ladies. I had to stop trying to change them into my American upbringing. I've had to give up. Irish women won't have phone sex. I've tried and I've tried. Girlfriend after girlfriend ringing me and I'd be like, hey baby, what are you wearing? Girl, she's asking me what I'm wearing. Who are you there with? All oh, the girls are here, it's great crack. We've had 50 cups of tea. <laughs> Go into your room for a minute. Can you call me back? I have no credit. <laughs> okay, so, uh, what are you wearing? I'm not fucking telling you what I'm wearing. This is stupid. <laughs> Come on, what are you wearing? Off oh, jumper, I'm fucking freezing. <laughs> Well, put the heating on. The heating doesn't go out till six o'clock. You know that, it's on a timer. Like we're made of money. <laughs> Come on, ask me what I'm wearing. No. Come on, ask me what, fine, what are you wearing? I'm not wearing anything, baby. Put a jumper on, your flat is worse than this one. It's all damp, you're gonna get pneumonia. <laughs> oh, I'm so hot, baby. That's the other thing I've discovered. Irish women are always freezing. <laughs> you are the coldest race of people on the planet. 
I don't know what it is. The minute you get through the door of the flat, straight away, Jesus, I'm freezing. <laughs> It's very cold. <laughs> Jesus, I'm freezing. <laughs> are, you, are you okay? Is it, I, I don't know, I have bad circulation. <laughs> You're clapping because every woman in this room has used that excuse and every man has heard it. I, I, I don't know, I have bad circulation. Maybe it's because I stood in front of the fire the whole first half of my life and all the blood got stuck in my calves. That's why I have big red splotches there. In fact, if I was commissioned to make a sculpture of Irish female sexuality, it would look like this. And if I was commissioned to make an action sculpture of Irish female sexuality turned on, it would look like this. Irish women are the only race of people on the planet who can come into your room, get completely naked in front of you, and for some strange miracle, you will never see a single part of their anatomy. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. They learnt this little Celtic shameful shimmy. <laughs> and just when you think you're gonna see it, straight away, shoom, <laughs> under the duvet. Jesus, I'm freezing. <laughs> have, you, have you not got a hot water bottle? <laughs> Stop bringing up hot water bottles.